Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about making animated short film in Clip Studio Paint, presented by Luciani Camacho. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that we'd like to go through. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. Question and answer session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded. The recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists are Fahim Nias, Joanna Broer, Mari Quinones, and Lucianis Camacho. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time and have never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready to publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. Learn more at clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. And with that, we'd like to pass the reins of the webinar to Lucianis and her presentation about making an animated short film in Clip Studio Paint. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Lusanis Camacho, or better known as Opal Lines Online. I'm a visual development and concept artist, but I mostly dip in all my like uh, interests into like 2D media. I'm a recent grad from the School of Visual Arts in New York City in computer art, animation, and visual effects, and I named my thesis film Check Yes as a result. I've been using Clip Studio since 2017, and I decided to use Clip Studio for my thesis because like, I was already familiar with it, and I had already used it successfully for matte painting and compositing homework. So the reason why I decided to go with it was mostly because of the versatility and the portability of the program. I was a commuter, so I needed something that was able to go on the go with me um, and anything that I needed it for. So I was mostly using a iPad on the go. So while I was on the train or in the friend's dorm, I was using this program. So with that being said, I will go into the first steps of the process. Um, so up here, you'll see just some concept art, but I'll be showing you some other things as well. So just a little bit about my film. My film follows my main character, uh, Prenda Lisa La Cruz, who is a Dominican American senior in high school who wants to be a hero when she's older. However, her mom is against her attending a hero academy after graduation, so she doesn't sign off on the parental consent form because of the dangers of hero work, you know, like dying. <laughs> so Hanelis ends up proving herself to her mom and her and herself um, when a robbery occurs at the, during a salon appointment that her mother and Hanelis is attending. So the biggest question that I get is like, you know, why did you pick mixed media? And I don't know if anybody has seen it yet, but I did a live action and 2D uh, kind of a mashup. And the reason why I did it was mostly because of budget. I didn't have a huge budget to do a live action film like I was expected to. So I wanted to do something that was budget friendly and um, I wanted to stand out. So when you do a animated film for a like, art school they usually show it to like recruiters and stuff like that and it's a long time it's like usually like three hours so I wanted to stand out somehow amongst all the people who were doing like 3d animations or uh, live action pieces so and also I'm a visual development artist so I wanted to do something that showed my storytelling abilities and my costuming abilities and you know being able to tell a story and a narrative through the characters and the environments that I chose so before you do anything with a film, I recommend you get write down a script. A script is super important. So uh, when I did my script, I used uh, here this program called Celtics. It's free. And you see here, this is my actual script that I used. I made like so many different versions, I lost count. But a script is super important before you hit the storyboarding process or even like, um, you know, making up characters. So making my story was relatively easy. Um, it was based off of my own life. So it was 
pretty easy to come up with some kind of idea that was like that was also like incorporating visual effects. However, things to consider when you're making a film is, um, you know, how many locations because that adds up to a lot of time. Um, you know, character building. You don't want your character characters to be flat or not appealing to the people who are like, you know, watching your film. So that's just something that you guys can do. So. I will be showing you uh, my storyboards. Well, more, let me show you my character designs first. So I went through different versions of my characters uh, quite a bit. Um, I'll show you one of my reference sheets. So right here is my uh, final reference sheet for my main character. So I had three animators beneath, of, beneath me doing some uh, rough animations. I myself am not an animator, but I kind of had to become one for this project. Um, so here is an expression sheet and like just a basic, uh, you know, uh, drawing of my character to so when I gave it to my uh, animators, they knew what they were doing because they were having to style match me. This is also super important to have because like, I don't know if you just have some like little um, doodles of your characters and you call that an expression sheet, you're going to have a, like a hard time, especially if you have people helping you and your characters are going to evolve a lot. Uh, for me, my character didn't really change much because they were based off of actual people. But again, if you're coming up with these people from scratch, your characters will change quite a bit throughout the process and even probably till like the last day you're working on it. Um, so I can show you what she looked like originally. She was more like this. And uh, this was just me kind of exploring what I wanted her to look like. I ended up simplifying her, as you could probably see, um, because it's hard to animate something like this super hyper realistic um, into four minutes. So you could see kind of she kind of like became a little bit chibi ish. Uh, but ultimately, it was necessary because the simpler, the better. Don't over add too much, like not too many belts and stuff like that. Like she she lost her bracelet and her sweater and all that stuff. And here I was planning like you know what her you know superpower was gonna be. Ended up uh and ending I ended up uh picking portal creation because I don't know I thought that would be cool. And I kind of like kind of designed it. And I eventually um you know in the film had somebody go into Blender and uh, model and animate this portal. His name was Cody Winchester. He did the animations in 3D and then rendered it. For it to look 2D. So that way I didn't have to go through the painstaking process of animating this portal like several times over. So it's just things to consider. Um, I can show you some other um, character designs that I have. Um, let me open that one. So this is for her best friend Javier. Like this is, you know, straightforward to the point. I did a little palette there uh at the bottom that i didn't do for rain but i was basically ha i had this open um while i was animating and so i would color pick um as i was going along and i will show you her mother's design uh so same thing uh my her mother was actually based off my own mom so <laughs> uh it was pretty easy to come up with this concept so like when you're making characters also like uh, like aside from keeping them simple, try to give them things that will make them distinct from the others and like kind of give them personality. Like that's like pretty key to costuming. Like, you know, everything should have some kind of use and they don't have to be overcomplicated. So um, as you can probably notice that um, Rain and Javier have the same outfit on relatively aside from their shoes. And that's because in New York public school, they usually have like the polo khaki combo, which is like, even though it's pretty simple, it says quite a bit about where they're from and where they're located. Um, and then for the mother, you know, in the Dominican Republic and people who from the Dominican Republic who moved to New York City, um, a lot of them go to the salon and have rollers in their hair. So I was just like, okay, I'll just do that. Like, that's a pretty typical, you know, thing of somebody of her demographic and age to do. So those are things you should consider when, you know, making characters and, and such. Um, now I will move into some storyboards. Let me close these. So I made seven versions of this storyboard, but I'll only show you like one version or probably like two. Um, but yeah, it was quite the excruciating process. So I ran through seven versions um, primarily because, uh, you know, I did this during school. So 
every say every other week I would present like my newest storyboard as I was like kind of discovering and exploring my concept and how I wanted to execute these things um and I'm probably not the best example of a storyboarder because um, they shouldn't be this detailed because you kind of get too attached to them. So don't do what I did. Um, don't put in a ton of detail into your storyboards because like they shouldn't be things that you should be attached to. Storyboards are meant to be just done very quickly and just to get the point across and they should be very clear. Um, they should be like a comic book. And, you know, I know some people have tendencies to over, um, you know, illustrate and stuff like that. So this was a i believe I just looked up storyboard template and then this is what they gave me so i thought this was pretty nice and like the smaller squares kind of made me not feel like you know what i was doing was too precious because i couldn't cram too much so try not to zoom in at 400 <laughs> percent um and i think i did this with the uh darker pencil uh brush and i just kind of went to town and did what i had to do um so i'll just kind of sift through these yeah so with storyboards, when you're doing actions and stuff like that, try to make it as clear as possible for your sake and for anyone else who's working with you. Because if the action is not clear and you're only doing like, I don't know, like every other three actions, um, it's gonna be really difficult for you to then like kind of visualize the uh, movements. And for me, I was doing a half live action, half animated uh, short. So I had to know, you know, how the camera moves were gonna happen because I actually eventually had to go on set and replicate my storyboard. So not to say that you will do that yourself, but that's something to consider. Um, and yeah, so storyboards um, are pretty key, especially if you are, um, say you're working a small studio, you, you would probably know that. Um, so yeah. This is just me kind of planning out what is what. Um, I probably should have added some shading again. Like this is my first time ever doing it. So um, please learn from me. <laughs> um, I could show you some old ones as well. Um, let's see. So this is like my, I think it was, this is my sixth try. This one was a little bit better. See, there's like actual gray shading and um, certain parts so you know who's in the foreground like like and then the background and stuff like that just helpful things to have when you're like actually in the animating phase and um you know trying to see what the heck is happening so you know once this is all done and you have all your uh storyboards you can go ahead and cut these out uh and like the individual squares and name them properly and that's another thing please name your stuff because things get really out of hand really quickly once that's all done and you cut those out, you can bring them into any editing program that you have for videos. So that can, I think I doesn't, did this in Adobe Premiere. Um, and you would get like somewhat of an animatic. So an animatic is kind of like your first cut. So uh, let's see. So I had this animatic for the, um, I believe it was my fifth or sixth go around so i'll just play it just really briefly so you can see what would happen so you kind of like move the frames in a way where um it's kind of like an animation just with no in-betweens <laughs> so that way you kind of have a sense for timing and um just how things are flowing because it's really easy to lose track of what you're doing when you're storyboarding so every so often just give yourself a day or two and like cut an animatic to together and see if what you're doing is making sense that way um, you actually have some kind of like quantitative way to kind of see your progress. Cause I know for sure, um, personally, I get kind of lost in what I'm doing and I kind of like then cut it together at the end and I'm like, hmm, this probably doesn't work. So then I have to return to the storyboards, which is why I had like as much as seven versions. And just so you know how many it, it went into one storyboard, I would say like 112 panels is about how, how much one storyboard had. So these do, these things do take some time, but they're worth um, putting the trouble into because pre-production is pretty important. So after animatics um, were done, I went in and said, okay, well, how do I want this to look? eventually like what kind of the what's the final style so then you do things called style frames which is basically a test of 
your look before you even attempt to do anything just so you have a cohesive thought of what you want your color palette to be and such and such and like that so this was like my main style frame that I would show people when I would try to like want to convey what my idea was. So I knew I wanted it to be like live action with animation. I don't know if any of you watch uh, The Amazing World of Gumball much or at all, but that's what my main uh, inspiration was for um, look and style. I really liked it. I thought it was unique and I liked how the show kind of meshed all these mediums together and it really wasn't and it wasn't offensive to the eye it was actually worked really well so i got like i think this was like a random stock fo photo from a bodega in new york or something or the dollar store and i just slapped my characters on it and like kind of try to give them personality so i myself could see what i was doing and then others who were looking at my stuff and my professors could understand what my vision was um here's some other stuff that i did this one didn't have like an actual background but this is more, more me trying to figure out who my character was and what her personality was because that's pretty important when making a story. Um, let's see. And yeah, that's pretty much it for that bit. Um, and then you don't have to do this if you're doing like a whole animated uh, piece, but this was required of me. They asked us to do a previs. So basically a previs is like, well, a pre-visualization of what your thesis or uh, what your film will be so i went out and shot with i believe this was a black magic pocket 4k camera and i went out and i just shot my um shots um tested it out and it was like, i think the mid middle of february and my film was supposed to take place in i believe september so it was a pretty rough thing but it was eventually helped me out because i could actually visually see what i wanted to do so i actually went to the locations that i wanted to film at and I just kind of softly did my entire thesis. Um, again, you don't have to do this, but if you think this would be beneficial for you to clear up your vision of your film, you should probably do that. And all these like drawings you see was in Clip Studio that I just eventually exported and loaded into a uh, After Effects. So with that being said, after your previs and Atomatic is done, uh, what I ended up doing was that I went and contacted uh, DPs, which are directors of photography, to shoot my live action, uh, well, we call them plates or like, but I guess most people know them as videos. So live action videos or plates or backgrounds. And um, I have a few pictures from shooting. Um, so let me load these in. Um, yeah, so. This was, I believe, on day two, no, excuse me, day one of shooting. And uh, because I was on a budget and I, you know, was lucky enough to live in the area that I wanted to shoot in, uh, this was actually my room in New York that I emptied out. <laughs> and uh, I like kind of set it up in such a way for my uh, film to occur. And I had a actress who was sitting here behind the camera and then here's my dp and then there's me very sweaty because it was the middle of august um i got an actress and an actor for the mother character my main character and her best friend who were the approximately approximately the same height and build so that when i would shoot these uh live action backgrounds I, all, I not only had a point of reference for where the character should be and how long the uh, dialogue would actually take. Uh, the animators also had uh, something to basically rotoscope off of, uh, and they didn't have to do much guesswork. So they knew exactly how large or how small uh, and what perspective uh, my characters had to be in because I already had those actors in there. So basically what I would do is that for one shot that I wanted to do is that I would take one take with the actress in it doing her stuff. And then we would take another one without her in it at the same length of time. So if you want to do something like I did, that's how I executed that. Um, so this was a voice recording and stuff like that. This was my voice actor for Javier. He's actually 15, very talented. 
and uh, from the area because the uh, accent or um, like kind of the tone of voice was pretty important for me. Um, record your dialogue first, don't do it the other way around. Um, I'm pretty sure it's like a no brainer for some people, but I did encounter a couple people while during my process uh, that thought you animated first, then did the voices. That is not how you do it. You animate to the voices. Um, and this was in school, uh, hence the very fancy tech. Uh, so this is also that same day in the really hot apartment. Uh, also same day. And then this was also, in, this was in the salon uh, for the salon scene in my thesis. And um, you can just see like the trash bags on the ceiling because we're trying to block out the light because it was really, really strong. And then we had like some cool fancy lighting with filters to make it look more comic booky and whatnot. Let me close these out. And then here, for people on a budget, um, this look, might look a little funny, but um, because of the coronavirus, it kind of hit in a really pivotal moment of my um, thing. So I had to record my own audio uh, at home. I ordered a mic and uh, I needed uh, blow dryer noises. So I just turned on a blow dryer on and off to a microphone and then I recorded it into GarageBand and it worked. So you don't need fancy stuff for everything. So let me close these out. Okay. So now that that's done, um, I will go into the animations and then one matte painting that I did because there was quite a bit. So um, actually, let me just open these two up. So I did a lot of ton of matte paintings to do like that 2D th uh, live action effect. So you'll see here, if you remember the girl sitting at the desk, this is basically what the final output was. So like, I'll like some, hide some layers so you can see like what I did. Adding like shadows and stuff like that and all that jazz. Adding posters. So I literally didn't have to do this in After Effects or like in composite in After Effects. I just did a straight clip and like did a crap ton of like multiply and overlays because I didn't want to be bothered with doing the compositing in After Effects and, or Nuke because my computer was very slow. Um, and same deal here, like literally just actual drawings that I like lit in Clip Studio. Close these out. Do not save. Um, and then some animations. And forgive me, I'm using Pro. Um, I used, uh, I did most of my animations in my iPad, which had EX on it. So if it does like some weird error, it's not anything to do with the um, animation itself. So here I have um, this one bit where um, uh, Javier is like kind of bouncing a basketball. And let me just play it so you see it. So very short sequence. Um, my, one of my animators kind of rough animated it. And then I like went over and did all like the pretty work, like the lines and the colors. And um, the ball is actually just a black blob that I put on multiply. So I had a guide for when I used the 3D ball that I used in the um, film. Um, I had like some kind of a guide, so I wasn't going in blind. So let me pause this so you can see um, how I did this. So this is playing at 24 frames per second, which is like the basic standard for um, animations. Um, and it's the less tedious ver uh, way you can do it. I know like people do sometimes do it in 30. I wouldn't do that because it's a ton of time. And stylistically speaking, I didn't want to do it that way. So I just put, picked 24 frames per second. And when you do these animations, you usually go to like a file new, and then this window will pop up. And then you hit here, the little window here where it says animation. And then they have already presets for you, which is great. I did it in 1920 by 1080, and then it'll fix itself. Resolution, I did it in, in um, 72, no, not 72, 144 DPI, but it's not really important because it's for the web. Uh, DPI is mostly for printing. And then here you like kind of name your timeline. So I just named it uh, Check Yes, which is the title of my film. Frame rate, you pick it here. So you have a ton of options. Um, scene number, looks like whatever scene I was in. So this was scene one, and then this was shot 22. And then you would just hit OK, and then you would get this. Um, so I usually like, I was actually more working in the layers panel than here. So I was a complete newbie to animation. So I literally just went off what I knew about illustration and applied it to clip studio. I mean, not clip studio to like the animation process. So here, 
let me hide this so you can see it. Uh, let's move more here. So you have the ball and the ball was like the lowermost layer. So then you see, I kind of like did his hand so it would accommodate the ball that would be at, that would be added later. So see that. And then um, this is his base color layer, which I just kind of, let me hide the clipping layer so you see it. So this is just me applying base color, nothing too crazy. And then I did a clipping layer. So I didn't have to stain the lines because I'm really bad at that, shockingly enough. And um, you turn them on and then there's all, all the shadows. And then you have, turn this off, you have the lines. So I used the G pen, it was great. Um, so I did the lines here and I cleaned it up. And then here, I have this habit of uh, coloring my uh, lines, like the internal ones. So I don't color the ones that are on the outside. I only color in the ones that are on the inside. That's an optional thing you can do. That's just a personal thing that I do because I think it kind of brings it all together. Um, but just be warned, it's a pretty tedious thing to do. So please make sure you have enough time to do that. Now, I will show you something that's a little bit more involved with two characters in it. So here, this is um, the point where her mom kind of barges in on her in her bedroom and I'll play it for you guys so you can see it in its full um, glory. So here she would be coming out of a door. Um, once I would apply the live action plate underneath of it. Uh, so you, I'm pretty sure you're seeing all the gradients in there and you're probably like, what were you thinking? Um, trust me, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> um, so I have two separate folders for um, Rain and then Giselle, which is the name of her mom. And then I'll just show you Rain because she's the one in frame right now. So same concept, base color, shadows, lines, and then the, col the colors for the lines. Now, so I know gradients is a problem for some people. So what I ended up doing was that I would um, make sure that the kind of like the shape of her hair was very like um, not abstract and like not super organic. It was basically one solid shape. And then I would just magic wand it and then take the gradient tool, pick the darkest color of her hair and then like go like kind of like extend it forward. And then it would just fill it in for me. Cause like at first I was kind of going brute force with the airbrush and um it was coming out with inconsistent results so please use the gradient tool it's so much better and you will have more consistent cleaner results and just a small tip for people who are working and like you know to protect your eyes please set the background to like a gray like this or neutral gray it'll save your eyes and you're more likely to see if you went out of the lines so with that being said um, oh, and then of course I ordered them in the order that, you know, they're in. So Giselle is like behind, um, uh, rain. So therefore you'll see like, uh, you order that in that fashion. So say you're done and you want to export, um, you would go to export animation and then you would hide the backgrounds and, um, so it's transparent and then you would hide in like i want to say that you should uh export your characters individually and not together that way when you go into after effects and you want to add like say a blur or like a glow you need to like you want to have them separate so it's not affecting the entire thing so you would go to export animation for one character and make sure everything else is hidden and then you would go to what i did was image sequence so you have that transparency and then I can't do it here, but it will ask you if, like what uh, file type you want it to be in. And you would select PNGs because PNGs have uh, alphas, which is basically what you consider transparency. So that when you bring it into any After, into After Effects or Premiere, it'll have no background. So you can put it wherever you want. You don't have to worry about doing any like chroma keying or like luma keying to get the background out. So now I will show you uh, how I have it in After Effects, just very briefly. Um, so this is like one of my projects. So um, let me see if it'll play for you guys. Um, in After Effects, they have something called like the playback quality. Um, it'll take longer if it's on full or auto. Put it to like a third. You don't really need a ton of quality unless you're doing some precise work. And um, 
this is what it looks like when it's overlaid over um, the background. And um, once it caches, I'll show you the um, actual order of things. So see, like that's happening. So when you have it exported as an image sequence, um, After Effects will like, kind of show you this little icon, which is shows you it's like literally a series of images. So my portal was a series of images like exported from, um, I believe Blender, yeah. And it plays pretty smoothly. The reason why you want to do an image sequence is because you're less likely to have the video get corrupted um, once it's in the uh, program itself. And, um, you know, if one, uh, frame gets corrupted, you're, you don't lose the entirety of the video and have to re-render. So um, I'll just show you the order of things. So this is just a regular live action plate, nothing happening really. Then I put the portal in and then I added um, one of the animations given to me and see, there's no background on it, it's just there hanging out. And then I added a glow effect to the portal to get like some kind of light and then another portal over here because um, the portal, like the other end of the portal is like, supposed to be reopening on the other side. So then now that you exported the characters individually, you can do effects to it individually without affecting anything else. So I can open up my effects panel and um, I use Lum uh, Lumetri color, which is like basically just like a color correction thing. So I can like control the exposure individually and not affect anything else. So Yep, same concept for a lot of these. Um, like, um, I think the only time I had to do some brute force was like doing shadow. So I'd have to like kind of trace where her hair was and then, um, you know, do that, make sure it's like not weird looking. So you can do some pretty cool stuff in like After Effects with your animation. So like, I think I would say like 30% of the heavy lifting for the animations making it look good was in After Effects, which luckily it doesn't take a lot of time. So, you know the result came out pretty good in my opinion. So, um, I guess one last thing that I will show you before opening up to questions, um, because I got this through this a little quicker than I thought. <laughs> um, it's this thing. So, if you remember in the beginning, my, I have this like kind of top down um, uh, shot where it starts at the top here and then ends here at the bottom where um, the entirety of the street is shown. Um, so what I ended up doing was that I would, I have a Mac, so I don't know if this is the same for PC. I would get the first frame of the shot, copy that, then go to like, say like a frame in the middle of the shot, um, copy that. I think you would like literally like press copy while watching the video. And then the last frame, I would copy that and then I brought it into clip and then I basically um, kind of painted the edges together to make one like uh, I guess panorama of the shot so then I went in with my 2d assets which I should probably show you um, so here are like my individual 2d assets like see that was like that sticker in her room um, one of the posters in the room stuff like that shoes so keep that in mind, brought those in here, did all I needed to do to that. And then I would export it as a Photoshop file because uh, After, After Effects can't read clip uh, files. Bring it into After Effects as a Photoshop file at, with layers. So retain layer sizes, I believe is what it, it will ask you to do. And then you can, and it already be in place at, and already in the perspective that you needed to do. And you don't have to do that so much stuff um, in After Effects or in Nuke if you decide to use Nuke. And yeah, like it's already there for you. You don't have to do anything crazy. Like, you know, everything's in place. And then, so when you open it up, everything will be uh, in the perspective that you need it to be in. And then that way you can kind of plan stuff like that. So, you know, just things you to consider that like, you can do a lot of planning and clip uh, for like um, films, uh, not only 2D, but even live action. Cause I have done quite a bit of matte paintings uh, for live action pieces in Clip Studio. And you can even do compositing as I show. And yeah, um, I think that's all I have to show. <laughs> um, okay. Um, do you want to think about it again? Do, if you still have anything no. else? Okay. I think I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We still have quite a bit of time, so um, I'm sure people would like to know, like, if you can just very roughly show how you use the animation feature in Clip Studio. 
yeah absolutely like on on an example you've shown yeah i thought about that that scene might yeah. be good okay so is there anything specific or like um just maybe just the setup of the scene so how you start okay. out creating, creating a file yeah so um again because i'm like on this weird version of it but um you would go to just new and you would go hit this little uh video button over here or icon and then it's gonna open this panel up and here they already have presets for you so when you make animations you either do it in uh 720 or 1080 which is like the basic hd sizes um work in 1080 because like that's pretty standard and then it'll do that, those things for you. So see, the width is 1920 and the height is 1080. Um, resolution doesn't really matter because your animation is for the web and you're not printing it. But I was working at 144 DPI. Um, and uh, it's going to switch to custom because you're not using what it had already preset for you, but it doesn't really matter. Um, in the timeline name, you just put the name of your, um, of your film or your project. Frame rate, I picked 24 because that's where I wanted to work at, um, which is pretty basic for animations, but um, you can also do 30 or 60, but be warned 30 or 60 is a lot of work um, because you're, you have more frames per second. Um, scene number, this is scene number. So this was from my first scene, so I had it set as a one. Uh, shot number was shot 22. I think I had a total of 30 something shots for my first scene, so I just put it as 22 and it'll like pre-name it for you when you export it um for you so it'll say for example it'll say check yes scene number one dash shot number two dash and then whatever you want to name it afterward if you want to name it like a specific uh character say if you're exporting it and say okay this is the timeline for uh this character um then you can do so when you're naming it um adding that dash um after it um but this is pretty basic um, I'm not an animator, like I said, um, I had people helping me animate, but I was the one doing the uh, color lines and um, the timing. So mm. uh, this is how I understood it and it worked out pretty well for me. Um, it's pretty beginner, but I got some pretty good results out of just doing what I had just shown you. And um, the animation timelines pretty much work in the same order as like you would do an illustration. So like obviously i didn't start out with the color or anything i kind of started out like hide this like this so i just did the lines first then i would do the base color then the shadow and then the line color and then i did the ball and then it won't play here because this is the pro but this is like the original rough animation sketch that i had and i was just going over it and like more clearly defining the shapes of like say his face and his head like he didn't have eyes there but like here like here he has eyes so you know you're adding those things in so any like more like questions Joanna? oh yeah yeah um so you talked a little about about the character design at the beginning um mm -hmm. And there was a question it's like do you have any tips on how to flesh out a character for a story so how important is the design and the background story of a character for what they eventually look like? Okay, so, okay, let me pull it up. So, like this one. Okay, so this was like one of the first ones that I did, um, cause like I do concept art um, aside from this. So um, their environment where they're from and their backstory is actually pretty important if not the most important thing to making a character because like for example if you're doing like a western um animation or something like are they doing cowboys and like say your character lives in a very um dusty place like there's a lot of like um kick up of the soil and it's very dry but like your character looks pretty like hydrated <laughs> and like um not all that gruff um it's gonna be confusing because it's not matching up to um their environment because like you know, believe it or not, like us as people where we live in our environment and our conditions affects what we look like and how we behave and um, our personality. And what we do and what we wear is a reflection of those traits. So for example, my character, Rain and uh, Javier, they're from New York City in, in Wood. It's a very urban place. It's a lot of, you know, 
um, there's like there's basketball. A lot of the kids are really into like sneaker fashion. So I made sure that like, you know, the sneakers were, were looking good. Um, the uniforms were, were accurate to the area. Um, you know, like I even looked up like what backpacks they were wearing. Like I wanted it to be as accurate as possible because when you're doing like a piece like I did that was culturally based, um, you know, you want it to be as accurate as possible to what they do in real life. And of course you have creative leeway. It doesn't have to be a hundred percent correct, but you want to make sure that that base is there. Um, I mean, like even the hairstyles, like this, like the hairstyle that Javier has is a hairstyle that my brother was wearing at the time when I was making this film a year and a half ago. So, um, you know, when you're making a character, it should reflect their personality um, and the environment that they're from. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay. Um, you talked about the storyboard in mm -hmm. the beginning. Could you open that file again if you have it? Mm -hmm. Give me one moment. Okay, open that up. Okay, cool. Yeah, so people are really interested in how you set up the layer structure. You talked about not having to like going too much into detail, but like mm -hmm. your backgrounds look pretty detailed and your your drawings yeah. are very detailed. Uh, can you can you show how you went about like creating those? Yeah, um, let me zoom in a little bit so you can like, see a little better. So here you probably recognize this uh, little uh, building from the previous that I showed. Like this is an actual building. So to save you guys yourself the trouble of like uh, drawing buildings like uh, over and over again, what my professor suggested to me while I was doing this, because like I, you know, I'm an illustrator, so I had the habit of wanting to be super detailed, which is what I ended up doing in this. Please don't do what I did. Um, but uh, with this pretty, I think it was like more on the simpler end uh, where the building was recognizable. What I did was that I literally just looked up on Google. I forget what the name of this building is, but I looked up the name of the building. I literally just lowered the transparency on it. And then like, I just traced over it. So when you're doing storyboards, tracing is okay when it comes to buildings. Um, and like backgrounds and stuff like that. And I always save it on a separate layer like this, cause I had this saved on a separate layer. Um, it's not there anymore cause I like got rid of it, but like I saved this on a separate layer. And then whenever I needed the background, I would just copy and paste it back into uh, the layer I'm working on. And then I would just draw, draw over top of it. So I wasn't constantly drawing it. So it's, as you can see, like the building is like almost identical in every uh, frame uh, because I was just copy and pasting it back in there. Um, so um, in that regard, um, when you're doing like stuff like wipes and swipes, like um, like here, like the um, people kind of walk past and then like kind of reveals these people playing dominoes. Ha like what I would do is I would have the um, shot that's already centered. Let me hide this really quickly. So this shot here, this is centered. Like there's no movement, a camera movement happening. So I would have this saved on another layer. And then I would just like, copy and paste it just a little bit like move to the right so it's like has this illusion of the camera moving in the storyboard when you're doing it in after effects you can all obviously just keyframe it to move but like when you're doing storyboards just have it have your um shot that you're adding camera moves to like on a separate layer so that you can bring it back in and just move it slightly so you understand what the camera move you're doing um is on paper um I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Because you, yeah. you showed the different layers and how you, you yeah. worked on this. Um, mm -hmm. So do you have any tips to keep it simple when you draw? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, if you're like super hyper detailed like I am, what I like to do is that I like to um, kind of go for more of a silhouette and like, a, like more of motion rather than like, I don't know, like, taking a lot of time drawing hair on the person or something like let me pull up this one specific one that I have in mind um let's see where is it oh so like this one um not a, like not a lot of lines I'm gonna be honest um I just tried to kind of I was more focused on the silhouette of what I was doing versus and like how clear the action was versus like how detailed it is like so if you look at these like these drawings like i i think this, this guy barely has eyes <laughs> so like 
it's like don't like to be too focused on like um i don't know like they don't see like make sure like the expression is clear but like kind of keep the line amount to a minimum um and also um what i ended up doing is i was taking a figure drawing class at the same time i was doing thesis so uh in figure drawing they try to they tell you like hey try to use as minimal lines as possible and keep your pencil on the paper well in this case on your tablet as much as possible and I kind of like that tip, like try not to kind of do so many lines, like try to do one fluid um, line to kind of, um, you know, express what you want to do. Um, so like, yeah, here, like, yeah, like this was very basic, like kind of like trying to break it down to simple uh, shapes and forms so that like, you know, if you have people working with you, they're like, oh yeah, that's so-and-so. Oh yeah, this is this character. Cause ultimately you just want people to know the difference between the characters and like, you know, you don't want to do like a very elaborate composite sketch of them for every frame because then it's going to take forever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, another technical thing, um, the question that we got mm -hmm. is you have, um, you have the, the, composites with your characters in the real environment and mm -hmm. it seems you have some effects laid over it like the pop art effect and like the the screen tone like mm -hmm. effect can you show how you created those yeah so hold on, let me reopen one of them give me one second i'll do like the bedroom one so let me zoom in so you can probably see like the little um they're like the screen tones and like the dots like i didn't know they were called screen tones at the time i just called them dots but um what i would do for those is that i didn't have like at the time i wasn't aware that there was like an asset brush to do these automatically so i if i knew that then i probably would have used the brush um and but i actually just looked up on uh on google they have like these uh transparent overlays of just like dots and i just saved them and then i would bring them in rasterize them and then overlay them to what i want and then i would just erase where they were like overlapping so like here for this like lamp i would just like erase around um mm -hmm. the curvature of the lamp and then to make it look like it's interacting with the light um what I would do is I would over, I, I basically just kind of went between overlay and multiply a lot or like soft light. Soft light was my favorite one. And then I would just lower the opacity to like 25 or like here I have like for 83, like it was just basically to lower the opacity while on overlay to make until a point where like I was okay with what it looked like. And then of course, if it's a little too strong still, what I would do is I would go with the airbrush um, have it like on like the little checkerboard transparency thing and then I would just like make it like kind of big and then lower the brush density to as low as I possibly could and then I would just go over it and to soften it manually where I wanted it to so like here you see it's kind of disappearing that's where I went with um the airbrush and stuff like that so it was pretty simple it was just overlaying some stuff uh some like pngs and then putting it where I wanted it lowering the opacity on multiply or overlay or soft light Soft light was what I use for the real life objects. Multiply was what I use for anything that I made in 2D. And then like, you know, just finessing it to the point where I like liked it. Okay. Um, so this was, this was definitely a stylistic choice on your end. Like how did you come up with the idea of using this kind of technique? Um, it was, um, believe it or not, I think, so I started this thesis process, um, in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, and I believe Spider-Verse had just come out that same time. And I went to go watch it over my winter break, which was like during the, during my storyboarding phase. And, uh, I watched it and I was like, that's cool. I want to do that. <laughs> so, um, I like, of course that was a 3D film. So I was just like, um, well, they use a lot of screen tones in a lot of places. Um, I believe they actually built it into the textures of the models themselves. So I was just like my equivalent of like building in my textures was like basically getting screen tones from the internet and like applying them in places where you would typically want to see them in a real comic book. So a lot of it was me looking at comic books from all like all points of time and seeing where they place screen tones and that's where I would place them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that film was was very very good. I think it probably influenced a lot of students at that time. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Do you have any other influences that helped you develop your art style and um, your, essentially your, oh my God, now I'm, I'm, I'm losing my words. <laughs> <laughs> your wish to become an, an 
making this fa film essentially, but also general, just your arts though. Oh, okay. Um, so for the film itself was like, um, of course, like Spider-Verse, like I just mentioned, um, Amazing World of Gumball was like my favorite show on TV at the time and I hardly watched TV. Um, and like the show was very like mixed media. So I was like, oh, that's a cool idea. Um, I had just watched uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world for the first time in 2018 which is pretty late, <laughs> but um, like I loved the way the transitions were like kind of like the whole entire like video game matched up with like actual people. Like I love that concept. So I kind of did it like that. Um, that's where I got my idea of like the title cards. Um, Suicide Squad and Birds of Prey was a big one as well with their like kind of like 2D integration. Um, and uh, My Hair Academia was like a huge one for the plot itself. I was just watching season two while this was happening and like I was super invested so I'm like I love superhero stuff and I like the way my hero kind of approached it so I was like oh that would be cool but like for um I guess like for like a New York kind of like uh style or something and as in general like like for my general art style um my inspirations was uh the comic book artist Jen Bartel uh Amanda Shank um and uh I don't know how to pronounce her name but she goes by Barachan um on Twitter I believe uh, those three are like my main um, influences and like their art is currently on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you are you active on on any other platforms or are you planning to be? Um, I just made a TikTok the other day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's yeah, Opal Lines is on TikTok, but um, I'm have my YouTube, have my Instagram, have my Twitter. I kind of use my Tumblr, not really um all by the same name by the way but um i'm planning to go to webtoon soon i'm like planning my comic i'm uh, making a comic uh kind of t t picking up from when this film t uh left off um but i don't really know when it's going to come out probably towards the end of the summer but that's pretty much all the social media i have right now are you working on anything in particular right now um, so for the comic itself, I'm currently like uh, writing um, with like, I have a writer, um, we're like kind of working together writing that and then I'm also like I'm in the process of figuring out what the uniforms are going to look like. Mm -hmm. So um, I love that because I'm really, really big on costuming. Um, so I'm like kind of working on the costuming for that and then aside from that I'm just like freelancing like random little things here and there for people who hire me and uh, <laughs> I don't know, like building my computer after that. <laughs> <laughs> um how i think that's probably interesting for a lot of people so you made mm -hmm. your your thesis project and you put probably mm -hmm. a lot of extra hours in besides your study so can you give like a, a bit of an overview of like how that worked for you yeah um so i like i don't know how familiar I mean, anybody is about with sva but um sva is kind of well known for having a really heavy workload especially if you're in the computer arts department so i was already drowning in homework when this was happening and um i was taking some studio classes as well so it was pretty difficult and i also commute about an hour and a half so um basically what i was doing was that um like a typical day for me would be like getting up at like seven in the morning uh getting ready for school jumping on the train um sometimes it'd be new jersey transit sometimes it would be the metros uh the metro like uh the new york metro system and i would just work on the subway or the train and then i would be in class and if it was like a like a humanities class like forgive me for saying this uh <laughs> studying my humanities teachers but like while they were talking i would work on my uh, my thesis film on my ipad and um i would uh also like um during breaks i would work and do that like so my i was doing like 18 hour work days like in between classes so it was pretty intense because <laughs> we had like a deadline so yeah, yeah. um we got another question regarding like the animators and the actors. Um, mm -hmm. How did you how did you find them? Did you just take your 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 classmates or did you ask anyone in particular for that? So for the actors themselves, I went on a website called Backstage. Uh, it's like a it's like kind of like a da database where you can put up like some kind of like uh, like like actors needed for such and such, and you would like put in your info like what you need, and that's how they reached out to me um for the animators themselves they were actually friends of mine from school well now they weren't friends of me at the, friends of mine at the time but i kind of put up like help wanted posters up in the animation departments of my school and like uh believe it or not the people who helped me were two juniors and um <laughs> yeah they were like really freaking talented and i was like wow i got really lucky <laughs> so um 
did you tell them like which program you wanted to use or what you were familiar with? Did you have any preferences at that point? Yeah, I was telling them that I was working in Clip Studio because it was the only thing I knew. Um, a lot of them were working in, um, I believe like Harmony, Toon Boom, and I, TV Paint was the other one. And I was like, well, I don't really want to like go through the process of learning a new program because like I'm on a huge time crunch because at that point I was already a senior and we and the due date was like March um, before coronavirus, of course. Um, so uh, I was kind of telling them like, hey, can you just like work in Clip? And they did. So like I, I ended up getting licenses for them. Mm -hmm. So, um, and getting them on board with that stuff and some of the people, some other people who helped me on the off uh, time were already using Clip or weren't familiar with it. So I would just like guiding them and like, hey, like use clipping layers to do this because it's easier. Um, this is how you use the animation um, timeline because a lot of them had never used it before. So I was basically guiding them and giving them like a crash course on how to use it as we were working. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, yeah, we have like one final question at the end do you have any advice for people who would like to get into for one storytelling mm -hmm. um do you have a preferred medium or like what kind of medium would you suggest to people because animate animating seems like really up there and how mm -hmm. do you stay motivated to keep animating okay, <laughs> okay. um so for the for the motivation aspect, um, I probably am a little weird in this respect, but what kept me motivated personally was that um, I was really passionate about what I was doing. So they kind of like in school, they really emphasize that. So like when you do any project, you have to make sure that you really love what you're doing and you really feel for the story that you're telling because you're going to be spending a lot of time with it. So you better at least like it. <laughs> so, um, you know, my story was very personal to me. It was like, kind of like my own way. I had never used my art to kind of express my feelings, weirdly enough, because I'm an artist, but it just never happened. So doing this film was me expressing myself and like kind of expressing expressing my grievances with what I was experiencing in my life. So um, that's what kept me motivated because it was kind of like therapy for me. Um, not to say that you have to do that with your own stuff, but at least like what you're doing and make sure it's something that you feel really passionate about um, while also being creative. Um, wait, what was the first part of that question I lost it? <laughs> um if you if you were to do storytelling um what yeah. format would you recommend for people who are starting out okay okay um for me personally i would just do one-off illustrations mm -hmm. um so when i was first starting out um I, I remember i was a huge sailor moon um, that was i am but like and when i was younger i was huge on sailor moon and that's how i kind of bro like broke into the social media sphere for artists and what I would do is that um, I was really into um, environmental storytelling. So what that means is and it's pretty easy for anybody starting out because it doesn't really cost you more than like a day or two to do or like a week, depending on your like availability. But um, uh, what I would do is that I would take like the main, like any characters from Sailor Moon and then like put them in an environment and then I would dress, I would set dress. Um, basically like for example I did this one piece where it was like Usagi from Sailor Moon sitting at her at a window and then I would put certain items to clue in certain things about her um, so like for example um, I believe I, I put like her Sailor Scout uniform kind of strewn out across the floor to like kind of infer, infer that she had just changed out of it and um, she was now in her like pajamas looking out into the city after like a long day of like you know crime fighting or something so like little things like that that um, you know, you can really be a good way to tell stories like while you're just starting out. And it's a one-off piece, not like a dedicated project. You won't like burn out. Um, and it's like a really cool way to start out because like, you know, think of like comic book covers or book covers or like anything that's just a one-off piece that t that communicates like, some kind of a message. That's like a good way to start in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I think that's it. Oh, so okay, thank, cool. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, we have we still have a lot of questions, but we're also like one minute short of of time now. So mm -hmm. I think thank you so much for for uh, explaining your process for the whole for the whole film. Yeah, absolutely. Thank everyone for coming. Like I was kind of surprised that there's so many people here. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, uh, Lucianis. Uh, mm -hmm. We are pretty sure that you have inspired a lot and in different aspects of the production pipeline, whether it's like storyboarding or making the story, animating. And thank you, Joanna, for for selecting the questions. And pretty sure there's a lot of uh, questions that were left over, but uh, 
this this time has, uh, has ended. Uh, we are covered an hour of webinar, but um, we learned a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Lucianis. Mm -hmm. uh, so before we go, I would just like to share some one last slide with you guys. Um, for more information, learn more about Clip Studio Paint. Please visit clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. Uh, if you want to watch the webinar again, we'll upload the recording tomorrow probably on our social media on YouTube uh, channel Graphicsly or Celsius Web. And for more information about Lucianis and her projects, please visit her Instagram, Opal Lines, Twitter, and if you follow uh, the bit.ly link, bit.ly forward slash Opal Lines YouTube, you will access to her YouTube channel and you can watch uh, Luciani's uh, short film, Check Yes. So with that, thank you so much, Luciani's. Thank you thank so you. much, Joanna. And thank I'll you. see you guys on our next webinar. So stay tuned and follow our social media. Thank you all attendees. Bye-bye. Thank you.